This is our actual current financial model for Slidebean. I use the spreadsheet twice or thrice a week, and I have done so since we started the company with, of course, certainly uglier, crappier versions of this spreadsheet in the past. But the point is, as a startup founder or maybe COO or ops manager, a financial model translates into informed decision making. A miscalculation can cost people their jobs at any point in your company stage. And it did happen to us and it was a terrible experience having to fire someone because you made a mistake in your estimations of company runway. So today I, I wanna dive into the financial model template that we use for our own decision-making. I'm gonna start with the mistakes that I often see founders make and then follow that with our broad approach to financial modeling. Finally, I'll do a quick overview of the spreadsheet that we've created, which is of course available for free to anyone who wants to download it. Okay, so let's start with the three main mistakes. First is using the financial model as homework or thinking of it as homework versus a tool. Second is growth-based versus driver-based financial models. And three is just using too many variables on homework versus tool. The first and most common mistake I see is when founders think of this financial spreadsheet as a homework that they need to fulfill for investors, a requirement that they need to fill in order to raise money. To me, a financial model, even a simple calculator of how much your capital will last is absolutely essential. You could just throw in your, your team salaries, your office rent, your server costs, and then extend that formula 18 months just to understand how much money you need to build your product and to operate your business. Don't do it because investors expect you to. Do it because you actually need to know how much money you need to do what you want to do. I actually, I actually spoke to this founder the other day. He emailed me because our consulting team had created a model for their business a while back, which had actually helped them raise their seed round. Now they were about to raise a series A and he emailed me again because he hadn't really touched this original sheet that we created, which just defeats the whole purpose of that exercise. You need to live and breathe this model. Absolutely make it work for you and for your needs. Now, the next mistake I see is building growth based models. So this this common mistake I see is is taking a starting revenue and then just multiplying that revenue by say 10% forever. Maybe they drop it to 5% after year 3. That's what I call a growth based model and Honestly, it makes no sense. It sets a revenue bar that you have to reach, but it doesn't solve how that revenue will be achieved. How big does the team need to be to grow 5% a month for two years? What marketing channels do you need to use? How much do you need to spend each month and how much does that need to increase every month? What you should be doing is trying to understand what the drivers are for that growth. Let's take an e-commerce platform, for example. The drivers are probably your organic visits, which you generate via social media or via SEO, maybe recommendations, and your paid visits that you generate via ads. So ads are super easy to calculate. Ads are driven by your ad budget and a cost per click. So you can define how much you're spending every month, that's an expense, and then divide that by your expected cost per click. And that gives you a number of clicks estimated to the website. The more you grow the ad budget, the more clicks you get. The organic traffic could be driven, say, by your marketing team and how much content they can generate, which is, of course, connected to how big the team is. Now, these are the drivers to your business model, and they cost money. So when you're estimating what's going to happen with your business, you are adding these expenses in, these these team members, these marketing costs, and they play, and then you can play around with those numbers to get the desired outcome. So you increase the budget by this much, which translates into this much growth. What if you spend 5,000 a month versus 3,000 a month? How much faster do you grow? How does it affect the runway in the end? Which of these scenarios or these roads take you to profitability? Does your current plan allow you to reach those metrics that you need before you run out of money or by the time you need to raise the next round. Once you start feeding the model with real values, once the cost per click is the real cost per click that you're getting, or the website conversion rate is the real number from real data, the model becomes a tool that actually predicts the future and you can trust it to make decisions. Remember that your job as CEO is just not running out of money. Now, just one last point before we actually jump into the spreadsheet, I wanna talk about complexity. You want a model that is easy to update and that is easy to manage. The financial model cares about broad KPIs, not specific ones. For example, you don't want to have to track in the model every single marketing campaign and every single cost per click. You don't want to put that on that spreadsheet because that's overkill. 
it's too hard to maintain. You have to fill in the values from your ads and whatever. Your CMO cares about those numbers, but not your CEO not the COO or anybody on the ops team. You're probably just gonna work with the average of your cost of acquisition from paid traffic. You also probably don't wanna deal with different pricing plans in the model, because those could change and you don't want to deal with how many people are moving from one plan to the other, that's just a mess. What you probably care about at this macro level of the financial model is the ARPU, which is the average revenue per user. The fewer variables, the easier it is to model and to understand. Spreadsheets are very much a rabbit hole, especially if you know how to use them well. And it's very easy to fall into this habit of diving too deep or trying to cover too many numbers and then just making a sheet that is no longer useful, but it's just this burden that you have to carry to update. Okay, but with that said, let me actually walk you through our financial model template. Not before thanking our sponsor for today, which is ChernMobile. I'm friends with the team. We have used their product for years, but beyond that, their product is just fantastic. It lets you track your customer subscriptions. It calculates churn rate and your lifetime value and your cohort tables. And every single one of those numbers is going to be crucial to be plugged into the financial model. If you run a SaaS company, you are going to need a full grip on these metrics. You're gonna see that in a sec. Let's just jump into the sheet. All right, guys, so this is just a standard, pretty much empty financial model template. Um, I'm gonna first walk you through each one of the sheets or each one of the parts of the model, and then I'm gonna get into some specifics or at least running some basic modeling in terms of expenses and revenue. Okay, so um, instructions, we have a community now where you can where you can go in if you want your questions answered, uh, you can book a call with our team, et cetera. But let's just jump into the sheets. Um, so the first one that you're gonna see here is settings. Uh, settings just gives you basic uh, stuff like setting your currency or your company name, uh, the model start date, so the model always starts on a calendar year. Um, so you can go back to 21 or 23. Um, then you want to do the company capital at the beginning of the model. So if you have any money now, if the company has any capital, say on January 1st, 2022, or whichever year you're choosing to start the model, uh, you should add that input there, and then it's going to connect to wherever it needs to connect. Finally, the, the standard income tax rate for wherever you're based in the U.S. these days is 21%, so that's that. Uh, and then you can define some spend categories. Uh, we define some basic ones here, uh, growth, operations, R&D. And this is essentially when you wanna tell investors how much, what percentage of your budget is gonna go on one category or the other. This is gonna be really useful to tell that. You're gonna see how this looks in a chart in a sec. Uh, next up is teams and salaries. So in teams and salaries, we essentially give you the option to um, like a simple version to scale your team automatically. Say for example, uh, well, you can define your own salary here. So if you're the founder or CEO, you can define your own compensation. Don't go too crazy with this. Define when you're gonna start working for the company. So this, this could be the first month of the year. Uh, and in this case, what you wanna do is say, well, I wanna add one higher per period. I mean, that's when you're starting to pay your own salary. Uh, you're not gonna hire another CEO. And then that means that your team's gonna be one. Um, for example, with another employee, say office managers, um, you might need more office managers as your team gets bigger. So you could set that to one and then set the maximum team to three. And then you can define that you're going to add new hires annually. So that will automatically create that role and scale it. Maybe that first role is not hired at the very beginning of the model. It's maybe six months later. Um, so just to show you how this is going to look, I'm going to get into the sheet in a sec, but, uh, here's the team, here's the salary. Here's the amount of people going to each role. So as you can see, the office manager here, we have one, then two, then three, all the way up to three, and that gets capped. Now, one uh, big advantage with this model is that this teams and salaries uh, thing is honestly, or it should be a simpler version of your team scaling. But if you don't want to use it, you can absolutely come here to the headcount section and just manually input values and just say, well, I want to hire, I don't know, someone part-time here. So it's going to do a 0 0.5 in that first month, uh, and then that's just gonna scale forever. Now that now that I mentioned this, notice how I changed this one to blue. This is just uh, habit working, but the way this works is, or the way the nomenclature of a good model is, uh, you can find this in intro, inputs and assumptions. So anything that you typed into the model should be blue, and that's very easy to tell that it's something that you manually hard-coded into the model. And if that number is black, that means that it's a formula, it's a calculation, or it's the result of something that the model is calculating for you. So in theory, black numbers should never be changed. There should always be a blue number that controls that black number. So on teams and salaries, for example, notice how all these numbers are, are blue. 
But you know, when we divide it and we estimate the monthly cost or the monthly salary, those uh, appear as black numbers. Okay. Um, so projections, I'm not going to get into projections now. Uh, projections essentially lets you estimate what's going to happen. We're going to get to this in a sec, but I want to first go through the other sheets. Um, then we have cash flow charts, which essentially tell you what the company is looking like uh, based on the expenses that you've added. So as you can see here, based on the people that you've added, uh, the capital that the company needs to survive for the first few months is $380,000 for the first 18 months. That's because you have... Uh, your own salary, and then you have your office manager salary, and then an office, another office manager salary. So assuming that your cash in the bank starts at zero, that just starts to scroll uh, all the way down to millions of dollars spent. Obviously, we haven't added any revenue here, so that explains it. Um, okay, so next up, we have uh, KPI charts, which uh, are mostly revenue charts on tracking specific KPIs, so I'm not going to get into that now. Um, we have a cap table in which I'll get in a sec. Uh, we have the financial statement monthly sheet, which is essentially just a monthly summary of everything that's going on the spreadsheet. Uh, so you have some room for some key indicators that you can track, but you essentially have uh, revenue, cost of goods sold, SG&A, and then there's the summary each, of each one of these. So I want to clarify, it's very important that you understand what each one of these uh, two mean. So cost of goods sold to me is anything that you need to pay for to sell the product or the service that you sell. For example, if you are an e-commerce platform, the cost of goods sold would be the cost of the goods that you sell, meaning your t-shirts or your food or whatever you're reselling, that is the cost of goods sold. And as your revenue scales, your cost of goods sold will scale pretty much proportionally. Um, on the other hand, you have SGNA, that's sales general and administrative expenses. And that's essentially things that are not directly tied to revenue, like your team, like your marketing costs, like your cost of renting the office, like your utilities, and pretty much everything else in the company that you spend on a regular basis, that classifies under SGNA. Um, so the big difference here is the cost of goods sold will determine your company's gross margin. So if you made $1,000 and you spend $500 in cost of goods sold to generate that, you essentially have a gross margin of 50%, which is an important number that you have to be considering. We're going to get into this in a sec later. Um, and last but not least, we have um, we have here the working capital and cat capex sheet. So a capital expenses is a category of expenses of things that you're buying, but that don't constitute, at least on the accounting uh, mind, don't constitute expenses. They're assets that your company has. For example, if your company buys a laptop, that laptop is an asset. It's not a full-on expense. It's an asset that your company has. Uh, because essentially if your company gets acquired or if your company goes out of business, those assets have value and somebody might purchase those assets from you. Whereas you know, the expense of rent is just something that burns every month. Um, so CAPEX is really important to keep a tag on. If you have, um, you have industry equipment or cars, computers are essentially not a big CAPEX expense because they depreciate really fast. So they're not that big of a relevant cost. So for most companies, for most startups, uh, CAPEX is not going to be a big deal. You're not going to have to worry too much about it simply because it's not that big. Of, it's not, uh, it doesn't represent that much money. What's, what's really cool about the CAPEX functionality, functionality on this sheet is that you can essentially add expenses automatically. Some of these expenses will happen automatically, like computers. So computers, for example, um, assumes that, uh, no, let me show you this, this is in projections in CAPEX here. So it, you know, the model is set so that you automatically estimate a new computer purchase for every new hire. In this case, we set it to $2,000, which would be an expensive computer, but let's just call that tech equipment. Uh, and then that happens whenever you hire somebody new. So whenever, say, in January, the CEO started, that's when you buy a computer. Uh, in May, you, you hire another person, that's when you buy another computer. So again, these are assets that the company has, that it keeps. It's in, the, in your balance book, if you will. Um, and every month, that value depreciates. Every month, you lose some of that money to depreciation. Uh, SGNA is really a simple sheet to understand. So most of you know, a big chunk of the sheet is just your payroll, which again is connected to the teams and salaries uh, sheet I mentioned before. But uh, most of the other expenses are just blue numbers for you to input. So if you have you know marketing platform, if you're spending money here, you can just add that as an expense. Say you're going to pay for Mailchimp for some marketing, so you're going to. You can do that and uh, extend it to the future and then maybe assume that it's going to get more expensive, so ex expand that. Um, 
rent, for example, it's you know it's it's very quick and easy to tie rent to your team. So say if you're in a co-working space in a WeWork space, you can very easily char change your rent based on the number of people. So one thing that you can do, for example, is connect rent to your headcount. So if you wanted to do that, you could come here to rent uh, in, into the office row, and we're going to connect that to the headcount row, which is just the total number of people that you assume that the company will hire. Um, so essentially say, well, my co-working space desk is 500 bucks, so I'm just going to connect here uh, $500 times your headcount. And then that expands forever. You set it to black. So this would be a black number now because it no longer, uh, it's no longer an input. It's actually a, uh, the result of a formula. But if you expand that to the rest of the row, that's just going to estimate how much rent you'd be paying based on your, on the way your, your um, expenses, sorry, your, your headcount scales. Now, one big recommendation when you're doing financial modeling is to try and keep everything structured and everything ordered because it's very easy to lose track of all of this. So this thing I just did here, which is bring in a hard-coded number of 500 into the model and say like, oh, uh, it's 500 forever. So what if rent changes? What if rent suddenly becomes 700 or 800? You have to go into this formula and find the 500 and change it, which is, of course, a mess. So the elegant way to keep a financial model well-structured is to keep those formulas, keep those uh, inputs in a single sheet. That'll make things easier for you, especially if they're connected to formulas. So instead of this, what we're going to do is come here to projections, uh, and then I'm just going to create a category here that says rent cost. And I know that rent cost is going to be 500 per desk. So instead of, on the SGNA sheet, instead of typing a 500 here, instead of doing that, I'm actually just going to go and source that number from projections. So I'm just going to connect that to 500. Um, in Excel, you need to do dollar signs if you want to lock that so that the row that's referenced is always the same. This is Excel Basics. I will plug a course in Excel Basics if you need to in the, in the description. And uh, that's it. So that's essentially connected. But now it's a lot easier to manage that because I can just go and change this to 750 and see the results here. So these sheets, these SGNA sheets, the, the cost of goods sold sheets, the working capital sheets, they become sort of like a detailed uh, summary or like a deep detailed output of everything that the model is calculating. Uh, but in reality, you're going to be spending or you should be spending most of your time, for example, on the projection sheet or uh, on the teams and salary sheet, which lets you control things or actually on the cash flow charts to see how the changes that you're making are evolving or are changing that. Notice how this is where categories start being becoming very useful. So, you know, rent, this is part of the operational cost. Um, but then your team, I'm going to say that the CEO is part of the operations cost, office manager as well. Uh, but let me, let's, uh, uh, let's change that to, say, a CMO. Uh, so you're hiring one CMO here, here. And we're just going to schedule that a hire for January 2023. And we're going to classify that as growth, right? So these are the categories that we talked about in the settings. Um, so here in cash flow and charts, you can see how the growth budget is now being distributed differently as your platform evolves. So that's really useful. Uh, there's probably some growth expenses from the uh, MailChimp expense we added. So that all is being accounted for. Notice that for marketing and growth, we don't have a single category for each one of these uh, lines. Like there's only one final category here, which essentially applies to everything else. And that's the way that works. Okay. So bringing expenses here is very easy. And what you want to do when you're at the very basic, maybe you don't have any revenue yet, you just want to bring in everything that you expect that you are going to spend as part of the business. Your team, when you're going to hire them, how many people you're going to hire, what computers are you going to buy from them, what desks, what other office equipment, uh, and then just bring those expenses into the model in the sheet where they should belong so that you can start to see here in charts and KPIs um, what the capital needed to run that is, right? So right now, the way we have it is the company needs about $500,000 to go through the first 18 months. And let's say that you assume that you're going to be developing the product, that you're not going to generate a lot of revenue yet, so that's going to stay at $500,000. Okay, so now let's uh, let's work on projecting some rounds of funding. So the model, this is a new feature on the newest version, but uh, it's it's available. It now has this cap table calculator, which essentially lets you estimate the actual cap table or the actual rounds of funding that your company might need to raise. Um, so this is 
most of this is controlled here from projections. So essentially, what we're seeing is that in order to pay for all of this, you are going to need capital. Uh, more important than that, you already like, and this is this is a good thing to balance the model with reality. Uh, this model is starting in January 2022, so that's not good because we're not. This, that's in the past, so let's maybe assume that you didn't really start then. So, you know, one thing we ought to be doing is just delaying everything until we actually have some capital to operate the business, right? So I'm just going to say that I'm, you know, I'm only going to hire myself or start getting a salary, say, in September so that we have time to raise the rounds. You know, rounds could take three, four or five months to raise. So let's just delay all of this stuff. Uh, maybe, I mean, let's keep the office manager for later. Let's say the CTO, who's ideally your co-founder, is hired around the same time. And I'm just going to keep salaries as they are, and it's a single CTO hire that you don't need to repeat. So now this is scheduled for September. This is scheduled for September. This is scheduled for January. So that's perfect. Uh, let's make sure that we don't have any other expenses here. We have a few. Uh, SGNA, we need to move this. So again, the first few months of the year, we don't spend anything. So let's set that here to zero. And let's say that these expenses, HubSpot or MailChimp, starts at 50, say, in July. Sorry, that's a zero. That's a no. And rent, since it's ideally, since it should be connected uh, to to your expenses, I'm sorry, to your, to your projections, there shouldn't be any expenses on rent here. We're probably seeing one from this manual input that we added. So that's, that's really important. This is a manual input, as you can see. We added it earlier in the, in the model, and this is just creating a big mess. The models. Let's make sure that we go back to the formula. You can just uh, you can just copy and paste the formula from another cell. Shouldn't be a problem. Okay. So um, now we can go back to to FS month and see that we don't effectively don't have any expenses from January to July. Uh, expenses start here, and then if we go to our KPI charts, sorry, our cash flow charts. We see the distribution of expenses, R&D growth, and so on. But it looks like the capital that we need is not as much as 500K. It's only 400K for the first 18 months. Great. So what do we do now? Uh, here in projections, well, let's let's assume that that's going to happen. Let's assume that we're going to be able to raise 500K. I'm, of course, rounding it up a little bit because nothing ever is this exact. And we, of course, assume that the date in which we raise this round is June, which is before we actually start making all of these expenses. Uh, we're going to call that round pre-seed. That's okay. And then here we can choose whether that's a convertible note or a safe or a priced equity round. We have a bunch of videos on the difference between priced equity and convertible notes, so you can check on those as well. But uh, if you want to see how this gets reflected in capital, we can actually go into the cap table. So the cap table gives us a few extra options. For example, we can define the initial share ownership for the founders. Uh, normally, normally, this is, you know, I'm just going to make it as simple as possible, where each of the founders starts with 5 million shares. We are not going to reserve any shares for advisors. You shouldn't just give shares to advisors that easily. Whole video about it. Uh, but you have uh, 10 million company shares. So that's a standard. Now, since you're assuming that this round is going to be closed as a convertible note, remember convertible notes don't immediately convert into stock. Uh, so you have to define a few settings for this. You have to define uh, an interest rate for the convertible note. You have to define a valuation cap. So maybe let's say that the cap for this round is $6 million, which is a decent standard these days. And the discount compared to the valuation is 20%. Again, big, uh, much more detail on our video on convertible notes. So what happens at the pre-seed stage is you may raise that money, but that does not translate immediately into equity. There is a pending conversion going on, right? Uh, but one thing that the financial model does is that it assumes that capital uh, injection into the model. So here it is. So here's the cash infusion, which I, for some reason, picked on the wrong year. Let's actually move that. I'm sorry. So let's move to June 22. There we go. Uh, OK. So now the company has cash. It never, this is, this is your very magic number as a, as a founder, your ending cash balance. This should, be, this should never be below zero, because that means that you ran out of money or that you, the company had a something to pay that could not afford. So this number is your you know, life and death as a CEO. Row 95 here should never go below zero. You can see this in the cash flow charts where uh, we now see that capital injection and that money, since we're not generating revenue yet, just that number starts dropping down and then you are bound to run out of money by March 2024. That's when you no longer can afford your bills. So 
you either generate revenue or raise another round before that. But um, with this said, we have a convertible note pending. Now, convertible notes don't convert into stock right away. They're waiting. They're waiting for the next market valuation for the company. So let's define that just to actually close this uh, open round. Let's assume that after you raise your pre-seed, you raised an actually an actual priced equity round. Uh, let's assume that this maybe happens. Uh, I want to say uh, a year and a half later, and that you close. I'm just going to round that to a million dollars. Sorry, not ten, one million. Great. So with that, we can go into the cap table to see how that happens. Uh, we can say that the valuation, the pre-money valuation of this round, maybe was five million. That's fair. Uh, so this will also tell you the, the amount of shares and the amount of ownership that each one of these investors get. Notice that in here, we have those pre-seed investors actually converting from that convertible note that they had into equity, as well as the new investors, the seed investors, converting into their, um, into their share. So that actually gives you the total number of company shares at this point in the company history, price per share, post-money valuation, and what you're probably going to care most, uh, ownership of the company. This model even has a really cool feature that lets you estimate the acquisition price for the company. So let's say that after this round happens, you get acquired for, say, I don't know, $10 million. Uh, it'll also let you estimate how much cash each one of them gets, what's the multiplier for the investors based on that valuation. That's just for later. It also lets you estimate a stock option pool. So if you wanted to create a stock option pool for your employees when you raise the round, you would be able to do that. So let's say that as you know, your seed investors ask you to, hey, you should define a, a stock option pool. Normally, investors will ask you to define this before their investment so that they are not diluted by the stock option pool. So that's the way this model estimates it. So you have 250K, 250,000 stock options that also get added here uh, as as, as stock options that also convert eventually if the company gets acquired. Lots more detail in our video about uh, stock options and convertible notes, but this is a fantastic tool to estimate how it will behave. Okay, so now it's time to do some actual revenue projections. So uh, my recommendation always is, again, control your variables from the projection sheet and then run projections in the revenue sheet. So for example, uh, let's do the simplest of the simplest of revenue um, models. Let's say maybe you want to do like a one-time purchase sort of thing. Um, so we need to define a few variables here, projections. So we're going to define on revenue, we're going to call this um, basic sales. And just give us some, some room here. And then we're going to say, uh, okay, we're going to spend a marketing budget. Uh, I'm just going to copy the format from here, and then we're going to say that that's going to be $10,000. Uh, and then marketing marketing budget growth, and then that's going to be, say, $1,000 more every month. And then we're going to have a cost per click to get someone to the website, right? So that's also a dollar value. Let's say that the cost per click is going to be $1.5. Great. So now with that, we're going to do the conversion rate is the last piece of the puzzle we need. Conversion rate. And let's say that 1% of our website visitors is going to convert are going to convert into a purchase. So it's 1%. 1%. Great. Last but not least, the price, right, of our of our products or maybe in this case the average price. So let's call it average sale and let's call that as I don't know, 50 bucks. Fantastic. So the idea here is to keep, again, track of all of these expenses or all of these variables somewhere so you can play around with them, test, modify, change. And then once you're, once you're happy with that, that's the model that you go with. But if you keep them all in the same place, it's easy to control them. And what's, re what's really important here is notice that I'm starting with the marketing budget. So it's the marketing budget that's going to drive clicks and the clicks are going to be affected by the conversion rate and then the conversion rate is going to translate into sales. So I'm actually going to connect all of this. So I'm going to go here to the SGNA and I am going to convert, let's call this direct response campaign. Yeah, so let's go campaign one. And again, I'm going to connect that. So I'm just going to say that our marketing expenses are going to be this. 
And then for the next month, well, actually, it's let's remember that this is only going to start when we launch the product, right? So let's say that, you know, the company really started operating in June. So maybe that product launches in November. So let's start November. So that's going to be, sorry, not an input, not a hard-coded number, but coming from here. And then this month and on, we're going to take that and we're going to increase that by this. So the previous number plus the new number. So that becomes 11,000. And then for the future, that didn't work. Oh, of course, we have to lock this row. So we're always referencing this, this row. Same here. We're always referencing this cell. So there you go. Uh, now, these numbers, since they're a formula now, we're going to turn them black. Fantastic. So we can control that from the projection sheet. So now we go to revenue. Uh, and in revenue, I'm going to do this in key indicators here. We're going to go on website traffic. So website traffic is really easy because we're going to have a monthly expense in marketing. And we're going to divide that by our cost per click, which in this case is a dollar and a half. So again, we're going to lock these rows. So as this expands, we're going to see that traffic increase. Now, if we want to be elegant about this, we don't get decimal traffic. So we probably want to round this to the nearest integer. So that's always going to be a whole number. Again, it's going to be black. And that way, we have an estimation of our website traffic. OK, great. So now with the website traffic that we're getting, we can very easily convert that to orders. So here in Revenue Source 1, we're going to call this Sales 1 or, or Sales Model 1, Basic Sales. Um, we're going to convert that to orders. So we're going to take the amount of traffic and just divide that by the conversion rate. Sorry, multiply it by the conversion rate. That's going to give us a number of orders. And then we're going to get a num an amount of revenue, which is simply going to be the number of orders times the price per order. And that's it. So now the big advantage of this, again, I haven't rounded these numbers. And of course, there's, there's cleanup needed here. But essentially, what, I've, what I'm concluding here, I'm connecting this to the actual final revenue line in that section. So that automatically gets connected here to consolidated revenue, which automatically gets connected to our financial statement here. So now the magic of this is we are actually estimating what's going to happen with the company based on how we behave. For example, we could assume that we're going to be much more aggressive with marketing and expand that a lot faster and actually go into the chart, into the KPI charts and see how that affects the company, see how those expenses affect how the business will behave. In this case, notice that we have a lot more expenses than revenue. So something here is not working. It's probably that you know the cost of acquisition per customer is not as great. Maybe this business looks like an unsustainable business in the sense that uh, you know it's in the future it's always going to spend more than it than it generates. Why? Because the marketing expenses are just too high. Um, so an easier, uh, I mean, an alternative here is to start playing around with these numbers and say, well. In order for this business to succeed, we're probably going to need a bigger order size. We're probably going to need to convert customers better. And by changing those variables, notice how the outcome of this business changed completely. Now this looks like a business that could succeed. But it, we understand, that's, that's the whole point of this. We understand why that business succeeds and what drivers and what metrics would allow us to succeed. If we start the company and we launch the product and we see a conversion rate of of one or two, and we see that, and, and back to these numbers on, on smaller average sales, and we use those numbers, that reality, to look at this chart and plug those numbers to the future, we can assume that this is a business that not, that's not going to turn a profit. So the financial model also works as a way to validate if the business makes sense once these numbers are real numbers. Now, this can, of course, become a big rabbit hole. You can start connecting a bunch of things around here and there, generate a lot of revenue lines. One thing we do often, for example, is actually bring those numbers from chart mogul. So uh, many of my models, what I essentially do is go into chart mogul and actually export. Uh, this is just some, some dummy data here, but um, you know, take the cash flow, export this into a, into a uh, spreadsheet, bring that as a, as a spreadsheet, and then just paste it here. So maybe that's revenue source number two, come paste, and then project from that. So again, I, what I what I like about this, this approach with Chermogo is that it gives you sort of like a structured 
uh, source of data where you have the amount of subscription revenue that you added or the cash flow. It can even, uh, if you want to go dive a lot deeper, uh, you can look into, for example, new business MRR, lost MRR, and churn, and use those numbers, all of those numbers literally, to project into the future. So those numbers, those inputs, those results become inputs here in the projection sheet that allow you to project to the future. So of course, that is a ton of content that we have actually covered, but it's definitely not going to be covered in this video. Um, just to show you a little bit of how that could look, I'm going to show you our SaaS financial model. So our SaaS financial model um, takes into account a bunch of different revenue sources, organic traffic and self-service subscriptions and how that how those different models behave. And with that, you can estimate ARPU and paid traffic and organic traffic and all of that. So this is all a sort of like an interconnected network of, uh, of variables that essentially let you connect, uh, connect or run these estimations for a bunch of different businesses. So downloading all of these is, is of course, free if you're uh, part of the Slidebean platform. And they, the models essentially operate the same as this baseline model, which, again, uh, you can customize to whatever you need. Uh, the only part that's different in each one of these models is the projection sheet, which changes or which um, which has a bunch of different variables depending on the business from e-commerce to marketplace to blog, websites, and stuff like that. But there is a specific dedicated tutorial for each one of those models because the projections work so differently. So again, the lessons learned from all of this. Use driver-based formulas to estimate what's going to happen in the future. I think, and, and, and more importantly, use the model as your day-to-day -day tool. As the, um, as the month ends, come into the model and plug the real value. Say you estimated that you were going to spend $25,000 in marketing based on what your model said. But the reality was that maybe you spent $23,000. So, okay, so come in, bring the real number, and have this SGNA sheet, these expenses sheet, actually match reality. Um, and then when, when you actually get a cost per click number, bring that in, you know, plug that number and put the $1.32 uh, estimation because that's going to make your future projections much more exact. Um, so I hope that this video was useful. There are a ton more of tutorials after this one. So make sure to subscribe or to just click on the next one. See you next week.